Uh, shall, shall you want us to play a bit? Would you like our musicians to play, or how are we doing? Okay, all right, we will continue. So, let us continue with our centering body prayer. It is Love Sunday. And so, the, uh, for love today, we're going to be using our heart uh, sign here for love. So, Let's, pr let's uh, practice first. So, Holy One, may love, whoops, encircle us. May love grow within me. May love reach out beyond me. Okay, all right. So, let's do this. Holy One, may love encircle me. May love grow within me. May love reach out beyond me. Amen. We continue with our Advent candle lighting. Last week we lit the candles of hope, peace, and joy. We're going to light them again this morning, and we're going to light our fourth candle, the candle of love. We have waited these many weeks of Advent. The celebration of his coming is almost here. Gospel writer Matthew tells us of an act of love by Joseph. He accepted Mary and her unborn child into his family. Love means having hearts open to something bigger than we know at the time together. This Advent, let us be open to love's challenges as we follow its path. May love light the world this Christmas. Love shines like a solitary star. Thank you. 
continue with our Advent prayer renewal. In Advent, we are called to become new, to make room for our own nativity, even when there is no room at the inn. Where we are busy, we pray for peace. Where we are sad, we pray for joy. Where we are bitter, we pray for love. Where we are despairing, we pray for hope. May this Advent be a time for love. Amen. And so we sing, dream a dream. for our um, scripture reading for today. Our reading this morning is Matthew's version of the story of the birth of Jesus. The prophets wrote about a teaching that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and to someone in the line of King David. So it is no surprise that in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, Jesus ends up being born there. They are in some ways part of his credentials for Messiahship. Last week, you heard about the virgin birth as also a kind of credentialing for a Messiah, since other important leaders in Jesus' time were also born of virgins. In Luke's story, there is no issue with Mary's pregnancy um, on Joseph's part. However, in Matthew's versions, you are about to hear that Mary being pregnant and being engaged was a big issue, so big that Joseph considered breaking up with her. To be engaged to someone was like being married to them, and he considers a divorce. But he changes his mind and opens his heart. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, 
but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us this day. So it's the last Sunday of Advent, and it's Love Sunday, so we have our Christmas tree ornaments on the tree. We have hope, and we have peace, and we have joy. I wanted to see if you can find them there. And then our last ornament for today is love. So we're going to go hang love on the tree over here. So we have joy. And we've got the other ones. I can't quite see them from where I am. But I'm going to put love right here. So now all hope, hope, peace, Joy and love are on the tree. And our Advent time of waiting is soon going to be over because Christmas is coming this week and it's very, very exciting. You can see that our characters are parts of our nativity scene. They're also moved as well. They're getting ready to uh, get to Bethlehem too. And so um, they're preparing as well. A tradition that's in found probably at your house and in many homes in North America and around the world is a Christmas tree. Do you have a Christmas tree at your house? We have one at our house, and we have one here at the church too. Now, there are different kinds of trees and different ways to decorate trees, aren't there? And all around the world, people use different kinds of trees and de different decorations depending on what's part of their culture and their faith expression. Decorated trees are always beautiful once they're done, but getting the right tree and getting it up can be fraught, and decorated can be fraught with challenges. I'm sure that we all have stories to tell about trees that pushed us to our emotional limits. At least I know I have a couple of them. If our Christmas trees could talk, what stories would they tell? Trees can teach us important lessons about love and life. I have a story for you today by Alan Crow called The Crying Christmas Tree. It's set many years ago on the Nakota Megawaning First Nation, which was formerly the White Bay Reserve, Whitefish Bay Reserve, which is on Lake of the Woods, east of Sioux Narrows, Ontario. So I offer you this story. Many, many years ago on a little Indian reserve that was uh, at that time called Whitefish Bay, there lived an old couple, Kokum and Tantanan. They lived by hunting and fishing. At that time, most of the people of Whitefish Bay lived this way years ago. Every winter, just before Christmas, people would leave for the nearest town 100 kilometers away. There were no roads going into the reserve, and not many people owned cars anyway. The people traveled to town by horse and sled by way of frozen lakes. It was a beautiful sight to watch them go, 
taking their pelts and fish to the markets. It took them two days to get to town and two days to get back. Kokam and Tantanen enjoyed Christmas to the fullest. Their grown-up children and their families lived close by. Kokam and Tantanen had many grandsons and granddaughters, and it was for these grandchildren that they looked forward to Christmas. Each year, they all gathered at Kokam's and Totanen's before joining the people at the community hall. One winter, Kokum thought she would surprise her grandchildren by choosing the Christmas tree. She went into the woods carrying an axe while all the kids were at school. Tatanan was away trapping and would be home that evening. Kokum brought home what she thought was a wonderful Christmas tree. She put it on the stand so it would be ready to decorate when her grandchildren came home later that day. But when the grandchildren arrived, the boys laughed and said it was too scrawny to be a Christmas tree. They took down the tree and threw it out. We'll go and get a better Christmas tree tomorrow, they said, laughing. Kokum was very saddened. Her heart was broken. She was sad that her grandsons would be so selfish. She did not say a word. Her husband noticed her quiet mood when he came home that evening. She helped him prepare his pelts and fish, for tomorrow they would be leaving for town. She wondered if her grandsons deserved Christmas presents. That night, the little Christmas tree came to her in a dream. The little tree was lying outside in the snow, crying and pleading with Kokum to bring it in. The tree was so sad. It wanted to please the children and celebrate Christmas before returning to the soil. Kokum cried too because she shared the Christmas tree's sadness and despair. Kokum and Tantana left early the next morning to go to town. They would be back on Christmas Day. Kokum avoided looking at the little Christmas tree as they left, but she knew it was there, outside, and sad. Kokum told Tatanen what had happened as they rode on their horse and sled. I went and got a Christmas tree for us, she said, but the boys threw it out because it was not good enough. They are so selfish. Maybe I won't buy them any presents. She stopped, wiping away her tears. Tatanen put his arms around her, saying, You will buy them presents because you are a loving person, and Christmas is a time for love. This made Kokum feel much better. Yes, she would buy everyone presents, and maybe someday her grandsons would realize <clears throat> what they had done and learn a lesson from the experience. A lesson that when someone does something for you, it is for love. Kogom and Tantanen arrived back home on Christmas Day, their sled loaded with food and presents. The grandchildren were there at their home waiting for them. The little Christmas tree was not where it lay before. They threw it into the stove, Kokum thought. The children came running out to help as they came to the door. <clears throat> there, was a there was a commotion as the kids grabbed boxes to bring into the house. Kokum went in first, carrying an armful of packages, and she wondered what kind of a tree the boys had brought home. She did not want to look but all the kids were anxious for her to see it. So she let the kids drag her into the living room, trying to smile and look happy for the children. The boys stood behind the tree as their mother was brought, their grandmother was brought into the room. Tears of joy welled up in the eyes of the old woman as she saw her little Christmas tree all decorated and looking beautiful and happy. My little Christmas tree, Kokum said, trying hard not to cry. 
Yes, said the boys as they came out. Yes, we went on the path you went to get the tree. It was a long way. We did not get there. We realized she must love us very much to come this far for a Christmas tree. So we came straight home as fast as we could and decorated your tree. You were right. It is a beautiful Christmas tree. Kokum thanked her grandchildren for being so thoughtful and her own children for bringing them up as such. She also thanked her husband, Tatanan, for his wisdom. In her heart, she thanked her little Christmas tree for showing the children what Christmas is all about. We thank Ellen Crow for this story. The tree taught the children about love, didn't it? They saw the lengths that their kokum was ready to go to get a tree for them because she loved them. And the tree also taught kokum about her grandchildren, that they did have good hearts. The Crying Christmas Tree is a story about a journey. It's a story about a journey to get a tree, but it's also a story about a journey of the heart. Our story from Matthew is also a journey of the heart. Joseph chose to put aside his pride and reputation to remain engaged to Mary, even though she was pregnant and the baby was not his. It would have been culturally okay for Joseph to have cast Mary and their relationship aside like that little three tree thrown out in the snow. He was the one who was wronged. That act of staying engaged to Mary was huge. So what is the teaching that this story offers? I believe that it's a teaching for the early church and for us about personal sacrifices and unexpected outcomes. Those unexpected outcomes that bring more love and hope and life. Kokum, her family, Joseph and Mary all went on a journey of the heart. They all learned that there was a bigger connection, that love's power connects us as part of a bigger picture, a picture we don't always see at the beginning. And so I ask, who are you in these stories? Who do you identify with? Are you like Kokum this Christmas, feeling angry and hurt? Are you like the grandchildren, feeling disappointed that what is offered you is not good enough? Are you like Mary in a situation that is dangerous and your future is at risk? Are you like Joseph, being called to make a sacrifice for another and not knowing the full picture at the time? Well, we can identify with them all, can't we? We have all been excluded and hurt and disappointed and in danger in different times in our lives. And this Christmas, we are all on a journey of the heart in some way. But friends, we do not journey alone. We are connected. We are connected by the power of love, divine love, a love that calls us and challenges us to cherish each other and our relationships more than getting things right or having the best Christmas ever. This Christmas, we are all on a journey of the heart as we deal with this pandemic and the restrictions. We have all been asked to dig deep and to sacrifice. And for those of you living alone, the sacrifice is greater. And we thank you. We are all part of something bigger. The fight to keep ourselves, the people we know, and those we will never meet as safe as we can. As we journey this Christmas season, I invite you to look for beauty in what you can. And if you are feeling that you are not good enough, ignore that critical voice 
It doesn't know what it's talking about. You are enough. And you, if you are struggling with that, call someone who will affirm your personhood. You are beloved of God in whatever way you experience God in your life. Let us reach out to one another and let no one be cast aside. And so we sing a song about a Christmas tree. Martin Luther picked the Christmas tree because it was a, a fir tree uh, in Germany um, to decorate around Christmas time because fir trees outside never lose their needles when they're healthy. And so this is the song, Oh Christmas Tree, Oh Christmas Tree. So we have a few announcements today. Our pre-recorded service for Christmas Eve is all ready to go. Um, so it's going to be on our Facebook page and you can watch it on the church website premiering at 5. A big thank you to everybody who was part of it. There are a bunch of folks here today who are part of it. So thank you so much. December 27th, we are not having a service. And uh, so we invite you to go check out other people's services that day. And January 3rd, we are back with an Epiphany service. A big thank you to everybody who was part of the Muffin Challenge. We were able to uh, get 16 dozen muffins to the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church TLC Pantry. They were gratefully received. Thank you to everybody who was a part of that. Thank you to Christine Beer, who made over 50 homemade cards that Diane and I distributed to people we felt needed a lift um, this Christmas. Offering envelopes are available. Um, you can also make a donation to the church through e-transfer and pre-authorized checking. Call the office for that. But don't call the office. Uh, well, you can call the office, but um, uh, Margaret and Gordon are taking some time off this week coming, and so they will return your calls next week. I will be taking time off this week and Diane is covering for me. Those of you who would like to take part in a Watch a Longest Night Blue Christmas service, 
Um, there is one tonight in Westminster on the Facebook page at 7 and sunset tomorrow night at 7 and also at Knox on the Knox Met Facebook page at 7. And thanks to Heritage for inviting us to their quiet Christmas service. It was beautiful. I think that's most of our announcements um, at this point. Um, let us move into our time of acknowledgement of your generosity and giving. And so, thank you. We are grateful today. Grateful for all that you have given this year, for the sacrifices that you have made, the gifts given. So thank you for all that you have given and also all that you have received. And so this, this plate, while it's empty, it is full, filled with our gratitude, filled with hope, and filled with the promise of, of the healing, the hope, and the new life that your gifts will bring in the service of life. And so let us sing our offering song God help us to treasure these moments of mystery. to our prayers of the people. I begin with a poem, Where the Light Begins, a poem actually for Christmas Day by Jan Richardson, and then we will move into a candle lighting time. Perhaps it does not begin, perhaps it is always. Perhaps it takes a lifetime to open our eyes to learn to see what has forever shimmered in front of us. The luminous line of the map in the dark, the vigil flame in the house of the heart, the love so searing we cannot keep from singing. And so I invite Colleen now to light our candles, our candles in prayer, our candles of strength, our candles of memory. And so held in searing love, we light these candles this day. In memory of those we have loved and lost and known to us. Those who have died from COVID-19 or complications who we didn't know. All who are struggling, all who are living with anxiety through the restless nights, and the fearful days. All who are grieving all kinds of losses. And today we offer prayers and light candles for strength, knowing it will not take the pain away, but a reminder of this love that is ever present, the light of healing, of courage, of hope, of wisdom, of guidance. And so in our time now, I invite you to name either aloud in this place or on the, in the chat box people that you are concerned about, places in the world, as we open our hearts in prayer. And so we 
enter into a time of reflection as Christine plays for us. And from there we will move into the Lord's Prayer sung. to the world. The tune is the same and the words are adapted. Joy to the world. If you want to do the actions for joy, go right ahead.
this time of worship, pondering in our hearts the mystery and wonder of this season, we go in love, making straight the path for the advent of love among us. And so from all of us here to all of you, we sing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.